get my notes straightened out. We're going to be in Luke chapter 19, and I've got uh, 30 minutes to, uh, to feed you with a fire hose, give you 45 minutes worth of message in 30 minutes. So I think I might be able to do it. Some of you are saying, there is no way you're going to do it. But All right. Uh, we're in Luke chapter 19. The title of the message uh, is borrowed from the great theologians Bachman Turner Overdrive. It's taking care of business, Okay. Uh, some of you remember the 70s, Bachman Turner Overdrive, right? A few hands uh, go up. I would have expected more hands in the 9 a.m. service, quite frankly. Um, taking care of business, man, and you guys can thank me later if that song gets stuck in your head. But, but here, what we're looking at is uh, the big idea that Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, he, he is, he's going to the cross, he's going to heaven, uh, he is going to pass the baton onto his disciples to continue the work which he began. Uh, and the great business that Jesus came to do was to seek and save that which is lost. This is where we left off in uh, chapter uh, 19, verse 10. Jesus saying to Zacchaeus and the crowd there, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so this is this great business that Jesus now is going to be commending to us. He's going to be the giving the command, occupy until I come. Do business until I come. And so he's going to communicate these three key truths in a parable that he's now going to tell. He's going to we're going to Jesus is going to detail the timing of his plan of salvation, the task that he has entrusted to his disciples and the test that is to come. If you're taking, it, taking notes, you can write down this first point, the timing of his plan of salvation. Luke chapter 19, we pick it up in verse 11, where we read, Now, as they heard these things, who's they? They is the disciples. They is the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders who were scoffing at him for going to Zacchaeus' house. Uh, and it's all of the above. As they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And so as they heard these things, what things did they hear? They heard verse 10, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. It also says that uh, they were near Jerusalem and they thought that the kingdom of God would come swiftly. This is all about the timing of God's plan of salvation. We've looked at this and, and we've examined the idea in the text leading up to this that the Jews of this first century had a very different expectation of the Messiah. They thought that the Messiah was going to come and rule and reign, which the prophets indicated that he would in fact do. But the prophets also spoke about a, a, not just a coming king, a conquering king, but they, they spoke of a, of a suffering servant. And, and the, all of the prophecies given, Isaiah, uh, one of many, you know, talking about how uh, by his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions and so on. And so th this is, is the, the image, the suffering servant image that did not fit with the first century expectation. And the reason for that is because the Jews were occupied by Rome. Rome had subjugated them and they <laughs> just wanted Rome out and they saw the prophecies of a conquering king as just what the doctor ordered. We need a guy who's going to come, kick Rome out, set up his rule and reign. The suffering servant can come later. Well, they got it backwards, right? Because the, the, the prophecies given are all about the, the first coming of the Messiah who would come as a suffering servant for the purpose and work of dying on the cross for our sins in our place. We need a Savior more than anything else. We need to be delivered from our sin. And so the suffering servant needed to come first, Jesus the Messiah, to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the idea. And so Jesus is cluing them in to this. He's saying, <coughs> look, I'm going to tell you a parable because you guys got the wrong idea. So we continue, verse 12. Therefore he said, now he's going to tell this parable, earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And we're going to see this parable in particular closely parallels an actual historic event that happened shortly before this, that every person near Jericho would have been aware of. He says this, uh, A certain nobleman, verse 12, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. 
But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Let's unpack this. Um, what we have here is Jesus telling this story. And it's, it, as I said, parallels something that these folks in Jericho would recognize, a, an actual story. Jericho was the city where the Roman procreator Achilles had built his palace. Achilles was the son of King Herod, and King Herod ruled over Jericho. Well, King Herod died, and when he died, he, he gave, relegated certain parts of his kingdom to his son. And so, to his sons, and Achilles um, there decided, okay, now the, he's relegated this area of Jericho over to me, but in order for me to be recognized as king over Jericho, I got to get the Roman Senate to buy off on it, because Rome was in charge, right? So, what Achilles did was he traveled to Rome... And he was seeking for the Roman Senate to appoint him as the king over Jericho. And before Achilles left, he called his leaders together. He entrusted the, the, his riches, his wealth, to his key people and said, basically, take care of operations, take care of business until, until I return. And so he made his way to Rome to plead his case that they might make him king. Well... <clears throat> After he had done this, there was a contingent of people in Jericho who didn't want him to be their king, and they sent this contingent to go to Rome to plead to the Roman Senate to say, we don't want Achilles to be king over us. Don't make him king. And ultimately, the Roman Senate denied his request. They did not make him king. Um, and and so, so Jesus uses this story now to illustrate the timing of his own plan of redemption. He says, I'm going to tell you this familiar story, but I'm going to put a spin on it, and I'm going to, to put it in the context of me and my future plan to go to a faraway country of heaven and then to return. And so he's telling his disciples just that, that he's going to go to Jerusalem, that he's going to die on the cross for the sins of mankind, and that after the cross he's going to go into heaven, and that just like Achilles, there, there, that there will be a contingent who don't want Jesus to rule over them. They don't want Jesus to be their king, and so they're going to petition, hey, we don't want this guy to be our king, but unlike Achilles, what's going to happen, the day is coming when Jesus will return from heaven with the kingdom and he will establish his rule and his reign. And in the meantime, the servants, you and I like the servants in this parable, we are commanded to do business with the riches that he has entrusted to us. That brings us to our second point, the task that he has entrusted to his disciples. Notice that the master in this parable entrusted his servants with 10 minas each. They each got the same distribution, 10 minas. Now, a mina is a unit of money, and uh, it was worth about 200 denarii. Putting that into perspective, one denarius was the equivalent of a day's wage for a laborer. And so he gave them 10 times 200, and you do the math, that works out to about 2,000 days worth of, of money that he gave to them to do business in this parable, in this story. Modern equivalent, gave, give or take, gave each one about a half a million bucks is what he did. And he said, do business until I come. And Jesus says that, that that's what they are to do. Look, uh, you know, the parable... Hey, take care of earthly business. The, the picture, the heavenly picture, is you and I are supposed to take the riches that we have been entrusted with and continue Jesus' business here on the earth. Now, the parable is similar to another parable that Jesus gave in Matthew 25. Maybe you're familiar with it. It's the parable of the talents. And a talent is also a unit of money that's worth about 6,000 denarii. 
And in, in that parable, Jesus gave one of his servants five talents. He gave another servant three talents. And he gave another servant one talent. And we're going to go on to read in our text here that when Jesus, when the master takes this accounting, we're going to see that, you know, in this, in Matthew's gospel, the minas that were distributed, two guys were faithful, one guy wasn't faithful. Same thing in the parable of the talents. Uh, when, when the accounting is made, you found two guys that were faithful and one guy who, who wasn't faithful. Now, in the parable of the talents in Matthew's gospel, each servant received a different amount. Here in this parable, each servant received the same amount. Here's how we reconcile the two. In the parable of the talents, what is in view are the gifts, the talents, the, the capacity that each one of us has in service of the Lord, okay? And so every one of us have varying degrees of talent, um, varying degrees of gifts that God has given to us. Now, we're all supposed to use whatever gifts we have received for the Lord's glory, for, the servant, for his service, right? And so, so that's what's in view in Matthew's gospel. And, and so, you know, folks up here, as an example, on, in our worship community, I'm always astounded at the things that happen on stage in our worship community. It's just, I'm so impressed because I have zero musical ability. I take a spiritual gifts test and have, and I score a big fat zero where worship is concerned. Um, the worship in terms of the musical worship. We worship the Lord in a lot of different ways, um, but, but specifically in view musically. I just have no gifts there. Now, these folks do. They have that gift. And, and they're called by God to use the gifts that they have to glorify him in whatever capacity. And everybody's been entrusted with, with gifts on varying levels. And the Bible says, as you're faithful in little, God will make you faithful in much. So, so that's the idea of Matthew's gospel. But here, in Luke's gospel, the parable of the minas, it's different. Every servant received the same amount. And so, whereas in the gift of the talents... Uh, you know, God distributes talents differently and you use them differently. In the, in the gift of, of the minas, that what's in view is the gift of the gospel that we have all received equally. That's the idea. That what Jesus is talking about here is that you have received the gospel of Jesus Christ in equal measure just as every other believer here has received that gospel. Now, that's assuming every last person sitting in these chairs, here in this room, here in the sound of my voice on the internet, whatever it is, has received Jesus Christ by faith. All right? If you have not received Jesus Christ by faith, then you have not yet received that gift, but it is God's heart, it is God's mind, it is God's desire that none should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. And so, the gift of the minas applies to you as you consider yourself to be God's child. I have received Christ by faith. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died on the cross for my sins, that he rose again from the dead, that he's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And, and I am a child of God. I'm a follower of God. You have received 10 minas. You have received this gift of the gospel. And the business that Jesus is talking about when he exhorts his, his followers to do business until I come, the business he's talking about is you investing the treasure of the gospel that you have received. You'll recall last week we looked at Zacchaeus. And here's a man, a scoundrel by every measure, and <clears throat> that the... the the heart of Jesus coming through. Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I, I got to have lunch with you today. I got to eat at your house today. And everybody's scoffing. You know, look at this guy. He goes in with, to eat with sinners. I mean, how horrible is that? No, how glorious is that? That God will, will and that's, that's the thing. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the glory of the gospel. That it's not, it's not your good works. It's not you getting yourself cleaned up to the point to where God will condescend and go, all right, fine, I'll come and I'll save you. It, it, it's that you, you, you're a sinner by nature and by choice. All of us are. 
And God, because he's a good God, because he's a loving God, because he's a merciful God, and he desires that you shouldn't perish, he comes and, and he comes to your house. He says, I, I love you, and, and I, I offer salvation to you. I offer forgiveness to you. Repent. Re- receive the gospel. And this is the business that God is all about. And we saw this with Zacchaeus, this beautiful picture. And we discussed last week this imperative that we should live missionally. That, that you know, two, two incredible truths in the story of Zacchaeus. One, that God is a God of love and of grace and of mercy and desires that none should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. And two, that if that's the way God has loved us, here's the big idea, that we should live that way as God's children. That we need to love people with that kind of a missional heart, that kind of a love that says, I need to look and to see how I can use this gift that I have received and do business with it. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10. I want you to understand, as we look at this parable, you and I today, we live in between verses 13 and 14 and verse 15. Okay, look at again, you see verse 13, he calls the ten servants and he says to them, do business until I come. And then what happens? Jesus ascends into heaven. We read in verse 14, there are those that reject. There are these citizens that hate him, that send a delegation and go, we're not going to have him rule over us. It's talking about those that outright reject Jesus. I'm not a follower. I'm not a believer. And so you got the two mix. you got the one that are the believers. They've been commissioned. They're called. Go do business. You've got the ones that say, I ain't doing business. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. But look at verse 15. And so it was that when he returned, Jesus is returning. That's the idea. And what happens when he returned? Well, he's received the kingdom, and he then commanded these servants to whom he'd given the money, the ten minas, the investment, to be called to him, take note, why? That he might know how much every man had gained by trading. How much every man had gained by trading. Listen, Jesus has gone into heaven, but the time is coming, the day is coming, when he's going to return. He demands that we do business, that we occupy until he comes. And, and, and this is the expectation, right? Let me illustrate this way. I got, I got a buddy that, uh, that I used to work with years ago. I actually, I worked in the ER, and I also worked on, on the ambulance at the same time. And, uh, and so in the ER, I worked with this guy's wife. She was a nurse. And he was a Torrance firefighter. And so, um, so I knew them both and would work with both of these guys. And his, uh, his wife, she worked the night shift as a nurse, but during the day, she had a side business. And she was a travel agent. And I actually booked my honeymoon through, through this gal, a lovely lady. And, and so I had occasion one day, I was talking to, to her husband and I asked him about her travel agent business. I said, is, that, is there any money in that? Is, that? is that like lucrative? And he started laughing. And he said, she's a horrible businesswoman. She's, he, he's like, there, there is no money to be had. He goes, this is a net drain on our account. Now, he's, he's a firefighter. He, she's a nurse. They're making great money. He didn't care whether her business was profitable or not. For him, it was like, this is her hobby. Right, and so, so his his attitude was, you know, she she doesn't have a dime, but she loves the idea of the business. So whatever makes her happy, she can go about doing it. He doesn't care. But will you notice there in verse fifteen, God doesn't see it that way. Okay, He does not see the business that He has called you and me to to share the gospel. That's the business. That's the family business that we're all a part of. He does not see that as unimportant as hey it's a hobby whether or not you make a profit or not doesn't matter to me no he cares very much notice again verse 15 what's he say he comes he commands these servants to whom he'd given the money to be called to him and what's he say i want to know how much you have note the phrase gained by trading gained by trading in the original language literally what this means is to undertake a business for the sake of profit Okay, that's the idea. You don't undertake a, undertake a business for a hobby. You undertake a business for the sake of gain, for the sake of a profit. This is what he is worried about. 
You see, we've got the timing of God's plan of salvation. We've got the task that he's entrusted to his disciples. But now what we take close attention to, we have a test that is to come. We have a test that is to come. See, unlike my friend who didn't care about his wife's business, it's a hobby, it doesn't matter, God cares very much about the success of our business (coughs) because our business is a family business. It's the family business that Jesus gave his life to. Because our business as Christians has been entrusted to us for the sake of gain. Jesus said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Right? The Bible says God desires none should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, he said, when I'm with those who are weak... I share their weakness for, here it is, I want to bring the weak to Christ. He continues, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can, for what reason? Doing everything I can to save some. That's the idea. That's the heart. That's the attitude. Now, let me just say, that's true for the Apostle Paul. Is it true for you? Is it true for you? says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? Here here it is for you. How can they hear about him unless someone, put your name in there, Joe, Sue, James, Jeff, Carrie, Michael, Susie, how can they hear about him unless Ted tells uh, uh, tells them? about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the idea. That's what's in view here. I want you guys to understand, it's heartbreaking. Statistically, only one in 10 people share their faith. Only one in 10 people ever share their faith. That means 90% of Christians are disobedient in this area. The writer of Proverbs said, the, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. This is a crucial business. And so it was. Notice what happens here. He calls there in verse 15. He wants his servants to come to him. He, he goes, I want to know, what, how's, how have you conducted business? Verse 16, then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. Got a great return. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. And likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. And then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. Right? And, and so he, he, he wasn't faithful with it. Now, hold that thought. We'll come back to that. But I want you to notice here, let's just focus on reward, first of all. Our reward comes in our place of rulership in the kingdom. How does he reward these guys? He says, hey, I'm going to let you rule over a city. If you read your Bible, specifically in the book of Revelation, there is a picture there, and it tells us that our reward for our faithfulness in the master's business, sharing the gospel, we will be rewarded by being able to rule and reign with him on the earth when he comes and sets up his millennial kingdom here on earth. Here's what the book of Revelation says. In Revelation chapter 1, it promises that God will make us kings and priests to rule the earth with him. In Revelation 2, Jesus says, To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father... Think about that. And I also will give them the morning star. He says again there, Revelation chapter 5, and this is actually a scene in heaven, the elders and all worshiping the lamb. And and what do they say? They say, you are worthy to take the scroll, to break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. So an incredible picture here for for every one of us. We have to understand what the future holds, that Jesus is returning, that he will set up a kingdom, he will rule and reign, and to the degree that you are faithful to invest the mina of your salvation, 
That's the degree to which you will be able to serve the Lord in the future. But not everybody did that. Look at verse 20. Another comes saying, Master, here's your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. What's he saying? He's saying basically this. Look, uh, you don't really need me. Like, you, you've, you've got it covered, and so I don't really need to do anything um, with, with this gift that you've given to me, okay? Uh, what you should be doing right now, by the way, is you should be taking a really hard look in the mirror of your soul and saying, have I ever led anybody to Jesus Christ? Have I ever shared my faith with anybody? Have I ever even invited anybody to church? Like, this is what's in view here, guys. And you go, well... PT, quit beating, you're beating a dead, like you, you, this was the message last week. Look, I'm not the one who repeats it. Jesus is repeating it. He's like, you guys still don't get it. This is so important to the Lord. He desires that none should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. I don't know if last time you checked, how did you come to know Jesus Christ? I venture to say somebody told you. Somebody obeyed this. Right? And then a, a day is coming when you're going to give an account for how faithful you have been. This is the, ex, the exhortation. People are dying. People are going to hell. I think of that pastor who once famously was preaching to his congregation. He said, look, people are going to hell, and there's a lot of you that don't give a damn about it. And then he paused for effect, and he says, and what most concerns me is that there's several of you right now, you're more concerned with the fact that I, your pastor, just said the word damn than you are with the fact that people are dying and going to hell. We have to understand, people are dying and going to hell, and God's called us. This is the plan. It's how it works. <clears throat> and so, uh, so he says, out of your own mouth, verse 22, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You know that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Then why did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? In other words, he's saying, you couldn't have even done the least thing with this treasure. Like, couldn't you have at least, you know, invited somebody to church or whatever? This is, this is the idea. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. Like, wow, he's already got ten. You're going to give him more? And, and it's not included, but Jesus would say, well, yeah, look how faithful he's been. Look how successful he's been in his investment. He's got the heart of, of I mean, he, he's... He's a co-owner in business. Like, he's, he's got this mindset that says, you know, I got an ownership mentality in this kingdom. Like, it's a family business. And so this is the heart. This is the attitude. This is the mindset. I used to work at Kentucky Fried Chicken when I was 16 years old, and they made me manager. I don't know what the guy was thinking. I don't know what he was smoking. But I was, I was 16 years old. I was the manager of KFC, and, and I, it was just a party. I just got to tell you, I wasn't walking with the Lord, and we would spend our time, we'd contact Borelli's Pizza across the street, we'd contact Party House Liquor down around the corner, and we'd trade pizza for, for chicken for beer, chicken for pizza, and, and I'd just party there at the, at the shop. Now, now, the owner had no idea, clearly. He should have fired me, but for me, it was just like, hey, let's just party. And a lot of Christians have this attitude, guys. To where it's like, hey, I'm saved. Well, you know, whatever. I'm just going to go about my business. Have I made my point? So, so this is the attitude. This is what's in view here. And so, so he says, take, take, the, take that guy's meanness, give it to the, the dude who's got 10 because he's got an ownership mentality. He's, he's concerned about the business. And, um, and uh, verse 26, and he says, For I say to you, to everyone who has will, for, uh, will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. He's not talking about if you're a believer and you don't share your faith that you're not going to go to heaven. That's not what's being said there. This has to do with reward, okay? This has to do, what's in view is like the judgment seat of Christ. What, what's going to happen is we're all going to stand before the Lord. If you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to stand before the Lord. You're going to give an account of all the works that you've done. And your works are going to go through the fire, and some are going to come through the fire as gold and silver and precious stones. And, and you'll be rewarded for that. But some of your works as a Christian are going to go through the fire as wood and hay and stubble, and they're going to be burned up, and the Lord's going to say, you don't get nothing for that. That's what's in view here. Is that some people, they, they get their salvation, and then they never care about the Father's business in terms of sharing the gospel. That's what's in view here. 
And he says now he deals with those that rejected him. The contingent, the delegation said, we don't want this guy to rule over us. Verse 27, he deals with them. Bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, and I'll slay them before me. This is what's in view is the great white throne judgment. Those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will also stand before the Lord. They will be judged. It won't be their works that are judged, but rather they will be judged according to their works. Okay? We as Christians, our works will be judged in accordance to reward. But those that have rejected Jesus Christ, they're going to be judged by their works. What have you done? Because you didn't ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. So, so what's your life look like? Trust me, you don't want to be judged according to your works. That's what's in view here. So the bottom line is, the servant didn't care about the master's business. I want you to understand this, guys, as we close. Hear the Lord's heart. I shared with you last week about the dad here who lost his kid. And he was desperate. Hell, somebody help me get, find my kid. We've all been, in, as parents, been in that position. It's the heart of the Lord. People are dying and going to hell. Hell is very hot and forever is a long time. Okay? And his plan of salvation inc- involves you sharing the good news that there is a God in heaven who loves you and who has gone to great lengths to give his life to redeem you. Have you shared the good news with someone else? Let me ask you, how's business? I want to close going back to those theologians, Bachman, Turner, Overdrive, right? Here's what they say. I put one of the verses up in the song for you. It says, you get up every morning from your, this is so hard for me to read this, I want to sing it. Get up every morning from your alarm clock's warning, you take the 815 into the city. There's a whistle up above, people pushing, people shoving, and the girls who try to look pretty. And if your train's on time, you can get to work by nine and start your slaving job to get your pay. If you ever get annoyed, look at me. I'm self-employed. I love to work at nothing all day. What are you working on? Are you working on nothing all day? Because people's lives hang in the balance. Thank you.